Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Maybe first have a look at, at the title here. I mean, so this is sort of work which has been going on for a while. And uh, well, there are some names. The only name which I really want to mention is Christian Mendel. I mean, later on in the talk, I will show some uh, molecular dynamic simulation, so I myself don't really know how to do such things, but I mean, I was very lucky to have him as a collaborator, and, and he sort of did this extremely professionally. Now, I want to maybe say another few words about, uh, about the title. I mean, first of all, um, it's about one-dimensional systems, so one-dimensional mechanical Hamiltonian systems, so you might think it's a little bit off the track, uh, which, of course, to some extent is true, but uh, the story is that um, if you look, uh, I don't know, Fusre Flatters or any one of these journals over the last 10 years, I mean, it's just absolutely amazing how much people, how much activity you have for one-dimensional quantum mechanical system. And for very good reasons on the numerical side, I mean, uh, one-dimensional quantum systems are more easy to access. And then, of course, you have this uh, zoo of integrable models for which you can do a lot of analysis and which a lot of interesting properties, which uh, despite the fact that young and young are, you know, 50 or even more years back, uh, it's a subject which has been not at all exhausted. And, and in fact, I myself, I'm at the moment involved in these things, and it's really fascinating. So during the study, you know, there, sort of, there came the issue. I mean, so what do we know actually about one-dimensional fluids? So if I, one-dimensional system is very imprecise. So, so what I'm really going to talk about are one-dimensional classical fluids. And in fact, uh, I'm going to study so from a pure sort of thermodynamic point of view, these systems, I mean, these are short range forces. I mean, so from a uh, thermodynamic point of view, the systems are sort of pretty boring. I mean, there's certainly no phase transition. Well, maybe if you go to very low temperatures, there are sort of phase transition like things. But anyway, I'm, I'm not, not, not interested particularly in, 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 in uh, low temperatures. And um, so, but dynamically, they are actually quite interesting. And this is sort of what I would like to show you. And um, I will sort of follow this uh, rather traditional approach. I mean, of course, there are many other things which one could study, but I will sort of do the most elementary dynamical quantity which one is typically interested in. I mean, you prepare the system in thermal equilibrium, and then you look at what we call time correlations. I mean, correlations of observables between, let's say, our initial, in, in the equilibrium state between, let's say, at the initial time and some other time, right? I mean, so it's sort of a standard sort of dynamical structure function. But before going into the actual subject, I have to give you some sort of um, introduction. And um, uh, let's see, uh, start this way. Okay, and so here's sort of the prologue. Um, so everything is centered around this observation that transport in one dimension is anomalous, which basically means that, you know, if I take a system and I've asked myself, you know, how much energy is transported to the system, it will not follow Fourier's law, but it will be sort of different what we are used to, let's say, for ordinary three-dimensional fluids. Okay? And uh, the story uh, sort of goes, at least sort of in the statistical mechanics community, was sort of very active uh, many, many years ago, and at that time, it was sort of running under the name of long time tails. And so I first have to sort of, I mean, some of, well, okay, some of you might have heard the name, but I mean, for the rest, I sort of have to remind you what was the issue of long time tails at that time. And, and, and you will see that what I'm doing is sort of, sort of connected, but developed in a particular direction, which at the time people didn't think about. So what are long time tails? Well, I mean, you, you look at the, at the fluid, I mean, let's say at the moment, I mean, not, not uh, necessarily one dimensional. Oops, so that's not the right button here. Uh, no. Okay, now we go here, maybe that's sort of, yeah, okay. So, you know, maybe not, not uh, in one dimension, so you have the usual kinetic energy and potential energy. I'm always thinking about, uh, you know, one component system, short range potentials, I mean, so. And then uh, the, the question is, you know, what, what could you say about uh, uh, correlations in thermal equilibrium? And from a dynamical point of view, sort of in some sense, the most obviously interesting quantity to look at would be something like a current, current correlation. For instance, energy current uh, correlated, you know, at space time point uh, zero correlated with the same current at space time point xt. So it would be such kind of two point functions which you are interested in. And so the question is, what do they behave? Well. You know, if you look at simple examples, of course, you know, they are conserved fields. I mean, they will have more diffusive behavior, so they have no reason to be sort of, you know, sort of completely independent. But, uh, but carbons, you 
think that they are sort of more or less independent, and therefore what people assume that uh, you know, these this carbon correlations might have a course, fine structure, but roughly they should look like a simple decaying exponential. Now, why? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, from a theory point of view, there was not so much you could say, but anyway, I mean, one, one, one basis for, for this kind of conjecture was kinetic theory. If you do the Boltzmann equation, you linearize, you discover a discrete, uh, you f f discover a speckle gap, and, and when you plug this into your correlation function, you see that you get exponential decay. So that was sort of, from a theoretical point of view, sort of the real basis for having uh, exponential decay. But then there's sort of another theory which you can find in, in Landa Lifshitz, that's this fluctuating hydrodynamics. And so I want to, since I'm going to use this, uh, I want to sort of remind you a little bit. Um, it's very simple. So I just want to remind you of, of what that theory is. Well, I mean, what, what, what you do there is that uh, you, you sort of try to write down something which is sort of phenomenological, and, and, uh, but nevertheless sort of captures uh, the, the large scale physics which you somehow want to describe. And um, for this purpose, I mean, let me just take an, as, a, as an example the scalar field. So, so I think of this as a density. And uh, well, it should satisfy a conservation law. So here I've written down the conservation law. And generically, you will have three terms in this conservation law. So one of them will be, uh, will be a systematic current. Um, well, for instance, you could have you know, a particular piece of fluid sort of moving relative to some other piece of the fluid. So there could be a systematic carbon. I mean, there will be a diffusive term, which is sort of here the second derivative term. But since we are doing statistical mechanics, if I just stop here, I mean, then you know, we don't have really any fluctuations effect. And so in order to mimic sort of you know, the other microscopic degrees of freedom, I mean, you simply add space-time white noise, and so you get this simple equation. Now, of course, in principle, there are coefficients here, also the d should depend on the density. For the purpose of this argument, I, I want to sort of ignore this and, and keep as only nonlinearity the fact that in general, you know, the carbon will be some nonlinear function of the density of the field. Okay, so, so this is sort of um, the starting point. Well, that's a complicated nonlinear equation, so we don't really know what to say about it. But uh, if you just want to compute time correlations, you might hope, you know, time correlations you can think of that you have one piece of the fluid and, and then you make a little perturbation, you know, you're computing a correlation. So think of making a little perturbation, some extra energy over here, and you ask how this extra sort of energy is sort of spreading throughout the system. I mean, that's sort of essentially the same thing as computing the correlation. Now, um, maybe if you're in equilibrium, maybe, you know, we can just, uh, uh, we, we can maybe just linearize around a uniform background, and that's what I'm going to do next here. So here's my uniform background. So you see that, that uh, now things become, now, now, the, now the equation has become linear. I mean, you know, what was before nonlinear is now just a linear term here. And, uh, and this was linear already. And now you see that you have a simple Gaussian theory. Everything is linear in the field. I mean, there's noise. And of course, you can compute whatever you want. And on that equation, you start computing what is uh, the carbon carbon correlation. So the current is now this, everything which is under, under this bracket. I mean, everything which is, so to speak, under the divergence, right? And uh, well, I mean, you do this computation, which is not hard, and you find that it's indeed delta correlated. So that sort of tells you some sort of consistency. I mean, you know, you expected exponential decay, you're looking on a very large scale, and that's really like a delta function. All right. So maybe we should test the prediction, right? I mean, uh, this is the second argument why it should be exponential. And then there's this very famous work of Alder, sort of, you know, sort of, I mean, he got the Boltzmann medal, I mean, for, for, for sort of, you know, starting this, uh, you know, flourishing field of, of, uh, of uh, computer simulations. And he said, well, let's just test it, okay? So he took like 200 uh, hard disks in, in a little box. I mean, you know, at a moderate density, I mean, not too high, not too low. And uh, he simply did what you would naively do. I mean, you just move, you know, according to the mechanical, I mean, on the computer, you just move the disk according to their velocities, and then they have elastic collision, and then you just keep going, right? And he measured the carbon-carbon correlation. In fact, in the, 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 his very first famous work, he looked at what people call a tracer. He just marked one of the spheres and followed its motion. But then later on, he also looked at collective quantities, sort of like, uh, total density or, or this carbon-carbon correlations. And uh, what he discovered was that it was clearly, clearly not exponential. I mean, this you see, I mean, once you had look at the, the data, I mean, and of course, you know, at that time, 
uh, compared to what we can do nowadays, it was sort of somewhat primitive, but I mean, the, this feature you could see very definitely, okay? And so then, of course, theoreticians theorist, theorist, became interested in the subject. And, and, uh, and um, uh, what was concluded is that these carbon-carbon correlations do not decay exponentially, but they decay with the power law. And in fact, a very simple power law, it's just t to the, to the, uh, the minus dimension over two. So in three dimensions, it would be t to the three halves. And then, of course, if you look at the formula, then you see that, that, uh, that in, in, um, in two dimensions, it will go like one over t, so it's barely integrable. And uh, people made a lot of, uh, uh, you know, transport coefficients do not exist in two dimensions, things like this. I mean, that's presumably a little bit sort of um, uh, over-exaggerated because, uh, you know, eventually, it's just a, such a small violation, it's very difficult to observe. But, you know, when you look at the formula, you see already that, that you know, if the take is like t to the minus one half, I mean, then something really drastic is going to happen. And that, that will be exactly sort of the topic of this presentation, okay? So I should mention, I mean, Pomo worked on this uh, for his PhD thesis, and then there's a famous review paper by Pomo and Reservoir, I mean, who sort of discussed these kind of things. And uh, there's uh, Ernst Hauger and Löwen. And um, uh, later on, I mean, they, they sort of started more from, from sort of microscopic models. And uh, I mean, these are difficult papers to read. But then later on, people realized that if you just are looking for these long time tails, what you really have to study is an issue of stability. Okay? Now, the issue of stability is that, you see, I simply naively linearized this original nonlinear equation. So here you have a nonlinear equation. Here, here, this, this is the nonlinearity. And um, what you have to do is you have to ask yourself, I mean, you know, after you, you have studied the linear, I mean, uh, is it justified the linear wise? Okay? So why don't we just do a perturbation theory and figure out what this perturbation theory is trying to tell us? Okay? And so how does the perturbation theory work? I mean, well, you can see that, that you know, now I have this carbon, uh, there's my background density, u is sort of the small perturbation, that, that's just a constant, that's a linear term which we took into account already, and then you will get a quadratic term as your first uh, correction, and then the question is, uh, is this stable? Now, of course, you know, you, you, you cannot compute so much, but you can definitely do perturbation theory in this quadratic term. Well, you do this perturbation theory, and what you find, which is maybe, you know, a priori, not, not totally obvious, but, but you indeed find uh, this, this power law behavior, and you indeed uh, find all the prefactors which people sort of got after many pages of theoretical argument. You know, there's a prefactor sitting over here, and these prefactors sort of agree extremely well with, with the numerical experiments. So doing this perturbation theory sort of seems to be um, sort of um, a good understanding where these long time tails actually come from. I mean, you know, there's a small instability, in sort of you have to include some nonlinear corrections, and they modify. Uh, sort of uh, the decay, but uh, it's not exponential, it's a power, but otherwise it's okay. Now, if you look at this in one dimension, you see that, that uh, there is already some sort of contradiction because, um, you know, we assumed here sort of like a diffusivity, and typically the diffusivity is sort of like the integral over this carbon carbon correlation function. Now, if you are in three dimensions, this is sort of integrable, this just means that. You know, if I include, uh, you know, perturbatively this small term, then th this coefficient is modified somewhat. But it's still a finite coefficient, and so, so you have to adjust sort of, uh, we normalize things a little bit, and then uh, things still behave in the same way. But if you now do this in, in, in one dimension, I mean, you know, you wouldn't believe even the argument, because, you know, you, you, you compute something where you assume that, that this carbon-carbon correlation is sort of integrable, and out of the perturbation expansion, you discover that it's, I mean, it, it decays only like, like one over square root, which certainly is not integrable for large t. And therefore, there must be some, you know, I mean, the scheme is completely inconsistent. Okay? So in one dimension, there is, there is a difficulty. And uh, now you look in the literature, and, and uh, of course, people realize that if you look in the, in the Pomo Reservoir paper, there is a, there sort of like, like one page about this case. And, and uh, uh, when you look at what, what, what they did, I mean, you know, they, they argued, I don't know, no, no, this, this cannot be quite correct. It should be rather than having t to the minus 1 over square root of t, it should be still non-integrable, but it should be a different power law. Okay? Now, when you look at, at the Pomo paper, I mean, you know, it, it, it's rather short, and he gives a very sketchy argument. 
And, uh, but, but eventually, uh, as you will see, I mean, at least he's partially right. Now, what, 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 uh, what did they miss at this, at, at, in, in this old argument? There's also another paper by Foster Stephen Nelson, sort of, uh, which is sort of a little bit uh, more systematic, but um, sort of basically follows a similar scheme. Uh, they also look at, at just a scalar sort of fluctuating field, and they also argue that one should see this two to the minus two third behavior. Um, so what, what these people missed at the time, you know, for good reason. I mean, they were not really so much interested in this one-dimensional case. I mean, the real physics were somewhere else, and so, so why spending too much time on this one-dimensional case? What they missed, and this is sort of what I would like to explain to you, is that, you see, this was something done for a scalar case. I mean, just a single conserved thing. Now, we know very well that if I look at the one-dimensional fluid, it will have three conserved fields. There will be energy, momentum, and density. And, and you really have to keep this, uh, this vector structure if you want so. And then you will see that, that you know, this answer is really only very partially correct. Okay. I mean, for the scalar field, it, it's a correct prediction. But when, once, you, once you have a vector-valued field, it's, it's, it, it, the situation is slightly more subtle. And this is what I'm sort of trying to explain to you. Now, uh, the problem was forgotten, and then uh, people sort of picked it up again, but in a very different setup. I mean, this is a sort of, was really a very important step, I mean, by Lepre, Levy, and Politi. But they did an, another, I mean, in order to see this anomalous behavior, they did something else. I mean, they basically took a, a finite piece of a fluid, and they put thermal boundary conditions on the, on, on the left, on the right. And so that, you know, through the thermal boundary conditions, you would induce an energy flow. And then they just measured numerically the energy flow as a function of the size. And of course, if it would be Fourier's law, then you know, the flow should go like, I mean, the temperature on both sides are fixed, so the flow should go like 1 over L. I mean, the energy flow should, you know, as you make system large, should go like 1 over L. But what you find is that actually you know, a little bit more is transported. And so there's sort of an excess beyond Fourier, which is usually called alpha. And then they measure numerically this coefficient. And it's clear that. You know, it's strictly positive generically, and, and uh, well, it depends a little bit on the system. But let's say for a fluid, it, 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 you always find it's strictly positive. And then they, there's a lot of discussions what is the precise value. And um, of course, that, that's very valuable work. Uh, there's very little theory. It's very, very much computer-based. And I will sort of take an opposite point of view. I mean, I will take a situation which, from a theoretical point of view, is sort of slightly simpler but uh, which allows you to do, actually do some theory, right? I mean, so in that sense, it's sort of I'm doing sort of a somewhat alternative program to, to this kind of uh, thermal boundary conditions. So here, I, I sort of emphasize again what, what, what I'm planning to do. So, uh, so I look at the equilibrium correlations of those quantities which uh, presumably are, have the slowest variation in time and space. These are the conserved fields and their currents. And um, as I said already, uh, for instance, for the total energy, what we will find is that the, current, the total energy current correlation will decay like t to the minus two thirds. But if you look at the total momentum, it will go like t to the minus three over five. The three over five, I mean, this is something which uh, the long time tape pe people simply did not observe at all. Okay, so now let's see what, what, what uh, I have to do here. Ah, okay, so ne next, next I talk about um, uh, sort of a little bit um, um, uh, of the system. So, so uh, of course, I want to do one-dimensional fluid, but then you look up the literature and, and, and you ask your colleagues who sort of know how to do a molecular dynamic simulation, you find that nobody actually simulates a one-dimensional fluid. For reasons uh, which are a little bit, I really would love people doing it, but, um, but uh, OK. They just don't. So, so what do they do? Well, I mean, you know, they argue in the following way to simplify their simulation. They say, well, I imagine that I have a hard core. So, so this is my potential V. So it's the usual Hamiltonian, OK? And so yeah, I have a hard core. And now they take a smooth part, uh, which has a range which is sort of, uh, you know, sort of, of course, it's, it's, it's less or, or equal to, to, to the range of the hard core. And then when you look at your potential thing, then you see that only you know, particles which are neighbored uh, in, in, in physical space, they can interact. And the, and the next nearest neighbor can no longer interact because there's the hard core which sort of prevents this. And then you see that, that the sum which you had originally sort of decoupled, you know, the sum which was over all pairs, now decouples only over nearest neighbor pairs. And that's numerically sort of a big advantage. And 
and that's the reason why I'm also using this approximation. You will see that the equilibrium uh, problem for, for, for this kind of systems is, is extremely simple. And, and that, that sort of uh, is sort of a little bonus, which, which uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, it just simplifies life a little bit, okay? Now, once, once, once you decide to make it like this, then you say, well, okay, why don't I really have to take such kind of a potential? You might also take uh, sort of like, like this fermi pasta ulam potential, which is sort of like a, uh, it's just like a quartic potential, um, and uh, or, or you might take the Torda, or you might take other potentials. Now, of course, once I do this kind of things, then you're going a little bit beyond our original class of potentials, because you see, in the FPU and the Torda, I mean, there's no ordering of particles. Nevertheless, you just argue that, that you know, I mean, you first label your particles, then you argue you're just interacting with the one which has the, the, the next label, right? I mean, so, so this is sort of a, the, the system which I'm going to look at. But uh, in fact, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, so, uh, you know, for the kind of things which I'm telling you, whether I look at unharmonic chains or whether I look at interacting fluids, it will be just the same thing, okay? So, so just think of this, I mean, if you don't like so much unharmonic chains, I mean, just think of this as, as a useful simplification, but, but the real system is, is, um, is a one-dimensional fluid. Okay, so what, 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 what is the program? So, so, okay, so I have to sort of, uh, uh, do like uh, uh, you know, sort of elementary course on on on, on equilibrium statistical mechanics. So, so I just have to say a few words about unharmonic chains. I mean, so so that you know you can really follow what I'm trying to do afterwards. And, and now this will be the most difficult chapter. I mean, so I have to tell you a little bit what is this nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics. Uh, so so there are, you know I have to to write down some formulas. I mean, so so you can see what 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 kind of uh, problem I actually have to solve. And then uh, I will basically go not into great details, I will just tell you what, what, what comes out of this theory. And then sort of the last chapter will be comparing the, the, the results from this nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics with molecular dynamic simulations, which are either these FPU chains or sort of hard collision models, I mean models of this type. And then in principle, but, but uh, at least my experience, oh, well, now it's, it's already half the time is almost over. Anyway, so, so I mean, there, there, there's really a fifth chapter on, on, a, on a more delicate uh, uh, phenomenon, which is in the same area, which, which sort of uh, comes up when, when you look at the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation. But um, most likely, I mean, I will not manage to say anything about this anyhow. Okay, so now let's see what, what, uh, uh, what is uh, the course. Uh, on statistical mechanics, so, so here, here's again my Hamiltonian. I would like to think of this like a lattice field theory. So, you know, I, I think of a lattice actually uh, rather than particles in the continuum. At, at each lattice side, I have a degree of freedom, which is uh, position and momentum. And, uh, uh, and, and this is sort of uh, the Hamiltonian of the system. Uh, it's useful to introduce this stretch variable, so, or the free volume. I mean, it's just a difference in distances, I mean, because it appears here. Uh, and now, once I, I introduce this stretch variable, then you see that uh, the Hamiltonian is just sort of a sum of single, single side Hamiltonians, and therefore the equilibrium measures are particularly easy. The stretches and, and the momenta are simply IID variables, and here I've written down their distribution. I have three conserved fields, and therefore I will have three thermodynamic parameters. One of them is the inverse temperature, one is the mean velocity, and then there's a parameter P, which is sort of the dual to, to, to this variable over here, to the stretch variable. And then you do a little computation and you see that, that this P uh, is nothing else but the average force and therefore you identify the P as a pressure in the system, okay? So I just emphasize that, you know, it, it's just in some sense sort of ideal gas thermodynamics except for the fact that you have uh, this pressure floating around and, and, and you have this potential. I mean, so, you know, there is a, a little bit of variation, but uh, Correlations in this in this uh, lattice field theory language are just uh, I mean it's just delta correlated it's just independent okay and uh, of course you know you you can take sort of a rather general class of potentials I mean here's one which you know you would not think of a fluid dynamical potential but for for a chain it's okay you see that it will go to zero over here but then I have to put a positive pressure and then everything is okay again right. Okay so that that that's that's easy and uh, now let's look at the equations of motion well. You look at the evolution of the stretch, and you see that it is of conservation form. It's a discrete derivative. And so I have already identified one conservation law, and the corresponding current is minus the uh, momentum at side j. Then I do the, do the uh, second uh, Newton's equation, and you see the difference in forces. So again, I mean, the momentum is conserved in these systems. But then there will be a third conserved quantity 
which is the energy, and you know, you just do the same computation, and of course you do find a local conservation law. So you have three conserved fields, three local conservation laws. Okay. Now, uh, the assumption is that there will be no more. That's a difficult assumption. Nobody knows how to check that, but uh, you know, sort of by experience, we know that presumably it's, it's, uh, most of the time is correct. We have two very famous examples where this is certainly not true. I mean, that's of course the harmonic chain, but more importantly is this integrable classical system, which is the Toda chain, which is the exponential potential. So, so th this is uh, are the two cases which we know. Then there are other, you know, other many body classically integrable systems which, which do not fall exactly under my scheme, but uh, I mean, those definitely fall directly under this scheme. Okay, so, so that, that's very important. You see, at that stage, we, we, by postulate, I mean, we say that we are looking at the strongly interacting system, which is non-integrable. Of course, you also might want to look at, for instance, the Toda chain is still a very interesting topic. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of things to be learned, but, but for my purpose, I mean, purpose of my talk, I will just look at the, the non-integrable systems. Okay, all right, so now it's, 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 it's useful, as, as, as one learns, it's, it's useful to combine, you know, not, not to have a too complicated notation, so combine things into, into three vectors. So here I have a three vector of, of, of conserved fields, which I call G, and then there's a three, work, three vector of conserved, and, uh, of the corresponding currents, which are collected here. Okay, all right, now what do we want to know? Well, I mean, and this is what I told you. I mean, we want to sort of prepare the system in thermal equilibrium, so I have to specify the equilibrium parameters, but I want to make the mean velocity equal to zero because by Galilean variance, I can take it out anyhow. So let, let, let's assume that the mean velocity is, is zero, the background velocity. Of course, you know, the fields itself will, will, might have non-zero velocities. And then you just look at this, 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 uh, this correlation, and uh, you have here uh, two spa uh, stationary in space and time. So here it's zero, zero, here's the space time point. You subject the average, and it's this sort of, in quote, structure function, which you want to know. That's, uh, that's a three by three matrix, uh, which depends on space and time. Okay, so and you somehow would like to predict what, what, what does this object look like as a function of space and time. Well, I will tell you already sort of a little bit of, of, of the answer because otherwise you might get lost in, in, in other formulas. And so, so what, what, what will be the answer? Well, the answer will be, first of all, I have to worry about the fact that it's a three by three matrix, right? And now the assertion is that, in fact, um, uh, there is a way to, to make it diagonal. Of course, you can, you know, for each J and T, you can diagonalize. I mean, that, that, that's of course not the, the issue. I mean, here the claim is that there's, there's a three by three matrix which is, Time independent, it doesn't depend on J, so it's actually computable from thermodynamics. I will not give the formulas, I mean, this will be uh, not so illuminating, but there is this matrix which I call here R, and if you do this matrix, so it's a theoretically predicted matrix. You see, it's not, not something which, which, you, which you determine numerically. I mean, I, I do an analytical computation and got, get this matrix, and if you do this matrix, you will find that the, the off diagonal element after these transformations are essentially zero. They're not immediately zero, but as I sort of look at large times and large distances, I mean, they will be zero. So eventually you just have to, you have to look, if you want to understand this function, you just have to look at the diagonal elements, okay? Now then there's a symmetry left, right, I mean, you know, for the velocity, so in fact, when you look at, at, the, at the central, I mean, the zero, zero matrix element after diagonalization, uh, this will be one important function, and the other one will be, you know, the, the sound peaks. I mean, this is sort of the, the one, one and the minus one, minus one uh, element. So, so there's, there's a one symmetry. So basically, we are looking just for two functions, okay? Now, the assertion is that if, if I wait long enough, these functions will become of scaling form as a function of position and, uh, a function of position and time. Okay, so I will explain this in more detail. I will show you what these scaling functions are. But at the moment, I just want to say that, that this one actually will have a shape function, which is, uh, which is a Levy function. And uh, it will have a width, which is typically of order of t to the 3 over 5. And this function will have a scaling function, which is computed from the carter parisi sang equation, and will have typically a width of order t to the 2 thirds. Okay, so th this will be the end of the story. All right, now uh, another thing is that, uh, aha, okay, so, so this is what I call the generic case. In fact, what we discovered is that there's a dynamical phase diagram. You see, there are particular potentials which behave differently 
it's all non-integrable, but still there are particular potentials which have some extra symmetry, or maybe out of the blue, somewhere else in your big sort of parameter space, there could be cases where things behave differently. Okay? However, they cannot be behave too differently. In fact, what we have identified is that there will be exactly three universality classes. Okay? And, and if I have time, I mean, I can tell you. All right, so now we have to see what, what, uh, what uh, we can do with, with this nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics. And so the starting point is just exactly the same as before. I mean, you know, I have uh, this conserved fields. So I can just write down the corresponding Euler equation. So I'm, I'm looking at large uh, scales, and then I will get a deterministic large scale uh, evolution equation, which is of conservation type. So the U alpha, alpha is from one to three, is sort of the, you know, it's a conservation, and the current, of course, uh, depends on, on, on all the fields, right? So, so th these are the, the, these uh, kind of things. Okay, so now you, now you do this exercise. So again, I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the average current is a function of the average fields is something which I compute via thermodynamics. So you linearize this, this equation, and what you find is that, uh, you know, as I told you already, but let me just re-emphasize, what you find is that, that, you know, the linearization of this equation produces for you three eigenvalues. I mean, there's one sitting at plus CT, C is the sound velocity, adiabatic sound velocity, one at minus CT, and there's one peak in the middle. And so from this equation, you realize already that whatever this function looks like exactly, it must have three peaks. Okay, so here are the three peaks. Okay, so these are moving at constant velocity to the right and left, and one is sitting in the middle. This is usually called the heat peak, and these are the two sound peaks. Okay, now if I add interactions and noise and all kinds of things, I mean, all what is happening is that, of course, I maintain this, this, this structure because it's a first order derivative. I mean, that dominates the, the whole evolution. But then these very sharp peaks, which are sort of delta peaks on the level of this equation, will start to propagate, uh, will start to broaden, and, and uh, will broaden in a, in a very characteristic way. There's this landau blaschek ratio, which tells you that the area under these curves must be conserved, which is a simple consequence of this conservation law. So they broaden in such a way that the area under the curve, which is fixed from the beginning, uh, is actually uh, um, uh, conserved. Okay. All right, now you say, okay, fine. I mean, that's easy. I, I take my landau lipschitz volume on fluid dynamics. I look up how to do linearized hydrodynamics. So this is what I do. I compute uh, the broadening of the peaks, and what I find is all the three peaks, not surprisingly, because it's a Gaussian theory, are Gaussian, and they, s they broaden like square root of t, which clearly is completely inconsistent with any kind of numerical result. So that's certainly not correct. Okay, so we have to do better. And um, well, I mean, what we have to do better is that we, we have to sort of uh, uh, add more terms to the equation. In particular, we, we should not, not allow to linearize but we should, uh, I mean, of course, there are, could be other terms, but, but it, it's, it's the currents which are the important ones. So we should not linearize them, but we should include higher orders. Now you start to power counting in these equations, and you realize that sort of the proper way of proceeding is that, uh, that second order should be included, but higher orders are presumably not so important. And so let's just do this, this very simple exercise, including higher second order in, in the currents. And then for the rest, just follow what Landau Lipschitz tells you to do. Okay, so this, this is, I'm just going to write this down so that you get sort of a more visual impression of what this is. Well, okay, so here it is. I mean, so I expanded this, 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 this carbons to second order. I mean, so here is, is the linear term. Uh, here is the quadratic term. And then uh, if I want to do the carbon, I mean, I, I, I add here sort of like a la Landau Lipschitz, sort of phenomenological. Uh, a dissipative term, and here comes sort of a noise term, and the B sort of, of course, the, the noise component-wise is correlated, and, and the B sort of tells me how I do these correlations. There's a fluctuation dissipation theorem, which tells you that these two coefficients are uh, not completely independent, but they are related in this way, and then the C is the static susceptibility. Okay. Now, I should maybe at that point I, I should say this. You see, that there's sort of some sort of strange thing going on. I mean, I introduced these extra coefficients c and b, which, which I don't really know. I mean, you know, you, you give me the model, I have no idea what they look like. I mean, I, the, the covens, I mean, these things I can compute. We have a little computer program which sort of more or less sort of computes these things directly. So these, these, these coefficients we know, but these are totally phenological. Now, it so happens that if we look at the very large scale behavior, the result will be actually completely independent of what I picked for the d and b. And that's sort of a nice surprise that, that you know, a priori you introduce these coefficients, but sort of look okay, but, but you don't really know them. But at the end, if you really want to do the large scale behavior, you don't have to know them. Now, of course, if I'm trying to, would 
try to do more of a refined CRV, then of course I also would have to know something about these things. Anyway, so, so now, uh, let's see. So, so now the next thing is that, that um, we still need a little bit of um, information here. So the first thing is we need the st static susceptibility. That's just the equal time. So that's just this, this three by three matrix because things are uncorrelated, just, just at the origin. So that's the static susceptibility, which is another C by C matrix. And then this linearization and, and this matrix, they satisfy this nice relation. And, and the reason why I emphasize this nice relation, it, it's, it's not very difficult to show. It, it's true in great, 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 great generality. The, the reason why I want to emphasize is that the A, the linearization can be sort of more or less any matrix. And so, you know, it could be a very crazy matrix. But um, in actual fact, uh, you know, because it's sort of conjugated with something which is strictly positive and symmetric, A is actually not, not, not such a bad matrix. It has right and left eigenvectors and all these nice things. Okay? So now you, now you say, ah, you know, it, it's, it's the first order term which is dominating because you know, it comes, I mean, with, so this comes with the first derivative and then, then there are sort of uh, correction terms. So why don't we go to uh, a basis in, 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 which, uh, in, in which the A, I mean, the linearized term is actually Diagonal, okay? So this is usually called normal mode transformation. So we do a normal mode transformation, and this defines this transformation with R. So, so I just take the A, I compute the corresponding matrix which makes it diagonal. So here it has three eigenvalues, which we noted already, zero, minus C, and plus C. And then, uh, you know, you, you still don't fix the R completely, so we normalize things, and we normalize in such a way that the variance of the fields after transformation is sort of one. Okay, so 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 this is sort of this this transformation which sort of makes this this dynamical two-point function sort of approximately diagonal. Okay, and now you see that that I think I'm already sort of more or less done. And so so now I've written down for you this stochastic field theory in all glory. So here you see the field. I mean the linear term. Uh, I mean this is now the transformed field. So I called it phi. Here you see a term which is linear, so that that, that that's, uh, was my linearized equation. And if I forget about this term, I, you know, it would be a linear Gaussian equation, which sort of predicts for you this, this square root of t broadening. Uh, but now I have this nonlinear term, and that's it. So so there, there's nothing. Every, everything else is fixed. I mean, the, these coefficients are free, but but all these other coefficients are fixed. Okay. So now you have the nice a nice sort of theoretical physics problem. You know, what you would like to know is you, you have this nonlinear equation, you would like to make it stationary so, so that, you know, uh, things are stationary, in, I mean, translation invariant stationary in space and then also stationary in time. So we get sort of a field theory in space time, which is sort of both, uh, uh, you know, invariant under and, and translation in, in any space time direction. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a complicated equation, right? I mean, so, so, you know, a priori, I, I really don't know very much what to do. Okay. I think it's, it, uh, there's plenty of things still to be discovered on this thing, and, and I will do something sort of very, very, very simple. Okay. Now, the first thing what you what, what you want to know is, uh, you know, how well do I have to know all the couplings? I mean, you know, how relevant are they for the long time behavior? Now, this is sort of based essentially on on, on sort of numerical solutions. Uh, of some mode coupling equations, so I, I don't really can go into it. I just want to say what the conclusion is, is that when you look at, at these, these, these particular coupling matrices, it's only the diagonal terms which actually really are important. And all the off-diagonal terms, they sort of, you know, make small corrections, but they're not really important. So, so this is what I put here. I mean, the relevant couplings are, of course, you know, for the component alpha, but G is, you know, it's a Hessian. So G is a two by two, a three by three matrix, and it's only the angle elements which really are important. So that's one important thing. And the other thing which you discover, which again, I, you know, I, I cannot really say where it comes from, but, but it, it, it's not, not a very difficult observation. Namely, uh, this very particular G matrix, the G, G zero, 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 so this is sort of, you know, the, the zero component, that's the heat mode and itself coupling. I mean, that's this, the, the, the heat mode coupled uh, sort of quadratically to itself. This coefficient happens to be always equal to zero. I mean, it's not a difficult argument, but I, I, I you know, I, yeah, it's, it's some symmetry argument which you can do. Anyway, uh, but this tells you something very important, namely because you now it's sort of the self coefficient of the heat mode is zero, tells you that, that what you, and, and all the other coefficients sort of generically are, are, are non zero. But this is always zero, and therefore you must expect that the broadening of the heat peak, which is the central one, is actually different 
from the two sound peaks, because that self-coupling is zero. All right. Now let's see uh, uh, a little bit on the next thing. So, so, now, now, so I'm just trying to sort of give you a rough impression of, of uh, you know, how far we have gotten to analyze the stochastic field theory. It's not very much, and, and as I said, I mean, there's a lot of room to do more. But um, one, one argument is sort of the decoupling argument. You know, you, know, you look at, at products of this, this type here, uh, let's say the field with component alpha and here the field with component gamma. And uh, now let's assume that alpha is different from gamma. So this means that these fields sort of, I mean, you know, they have distinct velocities. I mean, one is maybe the heat mode, which is sitting here, and then the other one is the sound mode, which is moving all the way over here. And therefore you would think that if I wait sufficiently long, maybe they, I can think of them as more or less being independent, okay? So this is the decoupling argument. It, it's just an argument. I mean, you know, there's no, no real sort of good, uh, sort of, uh, you know, real sort of more analytical work which would support this. But let, let's simply assume this. So then if this is the case, I mean, then I can just ignore all the couplings. And you see that now I'm sort of reduced to a, to a scalar equation. So that's the phi one. Here's the quadratic self-coupling term. I look here at the G11. So I know that this coefficient is zero, okay, and non-zero. Okay, and then, uh, you, okay, so then I get this noise, and then you see, well, but you know, this is a good old friend. I mean, this is so-called uh, stochastic Burgers equation, or if I go to the, to, if I integrate once, you know, if I think of this, can write this as a gradient of some height function h, uh, then you see that this equation sort of is just a standard Carter parisi sung equation. Now, this equation, we have, in quote, an exact solution. So what we know, uh, from uh, you know particular models which you can solve. I mean, this is some some time back. What we know is that that for this equation, in fact, uh, now they have even a proof for for for, for the continuum equation. So uh, uh, what we know is that if I now look at at the at the at the phi phi correlation, I mean phi one phi one correlation. If I look at this long times, it really goes like t to the two thirds with a particular scaling function, which you will see later on in in, in the numerical plots. But uh, you know there's some sort of formula which we computed for this in terms of uh, some Friedholm determinants uh, which you can sort of numerically evaluate and so in some sense this formula is numerically tabulated. You can find this on our homepage and uh, it's, it's sort of a known function, okay? All right, and there's also a prediction of, of what this lambda should be. That's a non-universal sort of coefficient which determines the time scale, okay? So you see that if I do the decoupling, I'm back to the one component case and uh, that's sort of my advantage compared to Yves Fomont that in the meantime, the one component equation we really understand very well. All right, so now uh, let's see what comes next here. Okay, so now, now what I emphasized already, now we have the trouble that, 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 um, that um, uh, the, 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 this argument fails. Okay, so maybe I should go back I mean, to see this. You see, if I would try to do this argument for the, for the heat mode, then, uh, of course, I can still sort of do this decoupling, but then this coefficient is zero. So now I'm back to the Gaussian theory, and that we know is not correct, okay? So for the heat mode, I mean, I cannot rely on, on, on this exact solution. So I have to rely on the fact that, that uh, you know, some, some other version, okay? So here we do sort of mode coupling to, to lowest order, which uh, I'm not going to explain, but the result of this mode coupling uh, analysis is that uh, if I look now at the heat mode, I will get this, this uh, 3 over 5 uh, exponent. Uh, and uh, and the, the scaling function is actually the standard uh, Levy distribution. So, so this is in Fourier space, this would be the function e to the minus which is uh, the Fourier transform of a probability density. And uh, which, however, because it's k absolute value, has a cusp near k equals zero. If I look at this in position space, it will have a characteristic power law decay. Okay? The KPC scaling function has a stretch to exponential decay. So it goes like, like, uh, uh, like three halves, so, so it has a quick decay. But, but, uh, but uh, uh, for the heat mode, we do find a power law decay. And you need the power law decay because the heat mode still has to interact with the sound modes. You see, if the, if the heat mode, if, you, if the theory would tell you that the heat mode um, has ex you know this scaling function has exponential decay? Then you couldn't understand why it still interact. Then you should say it must be must be Gaussian because you could not understand that it would still interact with the sound modes. Okay. All right. So let's see. So now I want to show you pictures. I think uh, it's sort of uh, 
anyhow sort of close to my time. So, 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 so this, this, is now, uh, this is now an FPU chain. And then what you should see is, is sort of here is, is the heat mode, which is sort of actually has sort of this, the, 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 this low decay. And here you have the sound mode, which is sort of moving out in time. And uh, uh, linearly in T, uh, and uh, uh, if I sort of uh, sort of zoom up and make a more precise comparison, uh, then this is the picture of the heat mode. So that's the three fifths exponent, and you see that it fits sort of reasonably well. I mean, of course, there are some wiggle here already. Um, and so as time progresses, this wiggle go further out. But here in the center, I mean, you see that the Fit is sort of pretty pretty accurate, and I'm show, I will show you what else. I had. Okay, and then this this you can see is is now is now the sound mode. Uh, so so the heat mode is, is is sitting somewhere over here. I mean this is why you have the slow decay. I mean the heat mode is sitting over here, and the, this one is moving this way. And of course it's not exactly yet this, the the KPC scaling function, but it, it it's very close to it. Okay. All right. So now let's see. Uh, okay, so maybe maybe I skip this. I mean, this would be nice, but I cannot discuss. So, so I want to say a few words about uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Um, so um, so th there's some group. I mean, that's Abhishek Dar. I mean, this, this picture is sort of a group of Abhishek Dar and ICTS in, in Bangalore, uh, who sort of like to integrate uh, Newton's equation of motion. I mean, for us, this was too difficult. And so we, we take sort of this, these hard collision models. Um, and I want to show you, just for comparison, I want to show you also the picture of those. So, so they are sort of come in, in, in three varieties. Um, uh, so, so one of them is, is what we call the shoulder potential. So you have this inf potential, which is here infinity, and then you have sort of like a shoulder, and then it's simply zero. And the shoulder shows in such a way that you only have nearest neighbor interaction, which I sort of told you at the beginning. Okay, so th this is one, one candidate, and there's another candidate which uh, is just an infinitely high potential. The, 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 that's an ideal gas, so nothing happens. So, so, so why would we even bother? Well, I mean, there's a very simple, so that's an integrable system. Clearly, does not fall into what I was saying, but there's a very simple way of, of actually breaking integrability. You simply assume that, that uh, the masses are alternating. So you know, at, at even lattice sites, you have one mass, and odd lattice sites, you have a different mass. And typically, the ratio of this mass, you, know, you can take various ratios. I mean, I guess a very common numerical value is equal to 3. And so we simulate this system, which is now, if you want to sort of like a unit cell has two particles uh, with this particular mass ratio. So if I take the mass ratio equal to one, that's integrable. But we are sort of far away from the integrable limit. And then if you see this, I mean, you can also do something else. I mean, you can sort of also, uh, you know, you can also introduce sort of like, which sort of, if you think of an of a anharmonic chain, it would be rather natural. I mean, you can think of a potential which is infinity here zero and which is infinity up here. And this potential sort of, so it's sort of a deformation, if you want, so of, of, of this quartic potential. And, and uh, I will show you one picture on this one. I mean, this, 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 uh, okay, so I, I will come to this. Okay, so, uh, so I believe that, uh, okay, so, so this, these are things uh, which, which uh, are sort of a little bit on the analysis of the data. So, so maybe because of lack of time, I mean, let me go, not go into this. I mean, I guess I just want to re-emphasize that, that, that all the coefficients for this, for this potentials, I mean, we know explicitly, okay? And so uh, now there's one thing I wanted to emphasize. So the way how we do the simulation, maybe that's one thing I wanted to say. The way how we do the simulation is that we first throw out the statistical initial equilibrium distribution by some Monte Carlo mechanism. And then we run the simulation for, you know, like 1,000 time units. And the reason why I want to, to, to emphasize is that, that there are other simulations which start with some nice uh, random initial configuration, and then they let, let the system run for a huge, huge amount of time, and then they sort of break it, break it up into pieces. This is not what we are doing, because somehow we feel that in this way, there are sort of less statistical errors. At the end, presumably, it doesn't make too much difference, but any case. So here I want to show you. I mean, so, so this, this is now, you see that, that for these hardcore collision models, the data are, are, are much, I mean, a little bit less noisy and, and, and even more precise. So uh, there's even sort of here a, a numerical estimate how much they deviate. I mean, that's sort of, you know, if you take the difference of this function, absolute value, and, 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 and you compute this difference, it's sort of of the order of, of, of 3%, right? And so you see the three fifth exponent. Uh, so th this is now the KPC case, which uh, it's much better. You see, it, it, I mean, before it was still tilted a little bit, and, and you saw these tails. I mean, all these things have disappeared already because uh, 
somehow for these models you can reach more easily reach I mean you, more easily you can reach asymptotia so to speak right okay so this looks uh, pretty fine uh, so now let me show you uh, this phenomena of universality classes so now what I do is I, I take I take uh, I take this square well potential uh, so this one here so I take this this potential and uh, I make it in such a way that sort of you know the the, the average value of, of my local uh, variable is sort of uh, exactly one half. So it's just exactly uh, one half of of a. I mean, so exactly in the middle. And so so I'm sitting, so to speak, at at the point of symmetry of reflection symmetry of this potential. And now what I see is something different, namely. Uh, so here's some logarithmic plot. So now what I see is now you see it look, looks to your eyes presumably you know uh, almost the same, but but it's not. I mean, first of all, you see now suddenly here the one half appearing. So this is uh, now the sound mode. There's one half appearing, and this is actually a Gaussian. So if I'm at that particular point of symmetry, then the sound modes are no longer KPC, but they're just simple Gaussians. Okay. And uh, if I now uh, go to the to the central peak, we also have to modify a little bit. I mean, you know, it's, it's still Levy, uh, but you see there's you see now the two third exponent up here, and so rather than having here the five over three, you have three over two. Now, of course, to your eyes, I mean, these things look very similar, and and but but yeah, just trust that you know we did a careful sort of um, uh, comparison, and, uh, and of course it, it's not absolutely perfect. I mean, you see here. You know, still a little bit of deviation. So, so, so the, the uh, um, whatever the pink curve. I mean, is is uh, is um, is a theoretical Levy distribution. I mean, but uh, you know, it's still, it's already very very close. Okay. So um, now let me see. Uh, okay. So now I will not go to say anything about the discrete Schrödinger because otherwise, I'm sort of running out of time, and it's maybe not so terribly interesting for you. And so I just want to sort of come to the conclusion. So, so, so uh, I mean, one thing with, which I think I'd, I emphasized uh, during the talk is that, that you have these three peaks. I mean, the central peak, which is Levy, and, and uh, generically, and, uh, and um, the two uh, moving peaks uh, are computed from, from the one dimensional Carter Parisi Sang equation. Um, I didn't talk about the carbons, but you can sort of extend this type of analysis and study actually also energy carbons. I didn't show you any pictures. I mean, you can measure these carbons. In fact, I mean, the, the, you know, the carbons were sort of the earliest measurements which were done on these systems, and people observed already these two thirds. But, uh, but then, then there was some discussion because, you know, there are a lot of finite size effects in these systems which sort of uh, make the life of both numerical people and theoretical people sort of a little bit hard. But uh, for these hardcore models, I mean, things work very nicely. And uh, if I would show you a picture, I mean, you know, you see sort of perfect agreement with, with what the theory predicts. I mean, so you get a two-third. And then there are only two carbon independent carbons. That that's the energy and the momentum. Uh, the density is conserved. I mean, so therefore, the, you know, the, we'll have no, no interest in carbon. And, and uh, you find this two exponent, OK? I did not explain the dynamical phase diagram. But uh, we just told you that, that there are only three distinct phases. And the funny thing is that, that uh, there's one phase which is sort of really out of the blue. I mean, uh, so th that's the most exotic phase. This exotic phase says that all three peaks are actually Levy, and all of them have uh, an exponent which is given by the golden mean. Uh, and uh, we found that. I mean, you can find it, but, but it, you, you have to find it sort of, uh, sort of um, by hand, I mean, there's no simple symmetry argument like like in the one which I showed you, uh, with, uh, with 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 uh, with the three half exponent and, and and the Gaussian peaks. There's no no symmetry argument, but but uh, you know because it's a high parameter space of potentials. I mean, you know, if you look somewhere, eventually you will find it. Okay, so there are, there are these three dynamical phases. There's one thing which which um, is a little embarrassing, and then maybe it's something for the discussion. I mean, uh, you know, there's the issue of stationary states for this stochastic field theory, which which is somewhat unresolved problem. And uh, of course, the real thing and the things I'm working on at the moment is that uh, uh, since it's a large scale theory, if I replace the classical fluid by a quantum fluid, you would not expect any kind of changes. But this is really up in the air, and uh, you know there are results which go in this direction. In particular, this discrete nonlinear Schrödinger equation goes already in this direction. But to see the phenomena which I told you for strongly interacting one-dimensional quantum fluids is uh, is totally unsettled at the moment. 
So thank you very much for your attention. So, so can you tell us what is the symmetry that is breaking that uh, makes you go from Gaussian uh, well, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, okay. So, so, so the, 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 I mean, the one which I told you is a little bit less intuitive, but but the simplest one is if you take a potential like e to the minus x squared plus uh, x to the power four, right? Okay. So let's let's take this this potential, which obviously is, is, is symmetric under x to minus x. And let's assume that, that, that the pressure is equal to zero, right? I mean, then when you look at your, you see the pressure is a linear term. It's, it's e to the minus the whatever beta. And then you have the potential uh, plus p of x, right? I mean, so if I make the potential zero, then, 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 then the x uh, average is equal to zero, right? And now you see that, that uh, because uh, this potential has such high symmetry, many of these nonlinear coefficients simply disappear. And so there are only very few coefficients which actually survive. So, so now, now this, this, uh, this decoupling assumption, which we made, is, uh, is, is uh, in fact incorrect. When, when you look at the value of these coefficients, then you find that the G1, so that's the, the let's say, the right going sound mode coupled to itself, is also zero. Okay, and, and, and similar one for the minus minus one. So all the main terms which sort of would give you KPC are actually zero. And then you have to look at the interactions. And once you do these interactions and you do mode coupling theory, then you get these kind of predictions, right? I mean, so in some sense, the, the, the sound modes completely decouple and, and just do a simple Gaussian theory, right? And then, then there's the back reaction onto the, onto the, onto the heat mode, uh, which gives you then this, this uh, 3 over 2. And uh, in the other case, I mean, you know, you, you use this sort of, I mean, you know, the, the potential looks like this, and so, so, so this would be your symmetry axis, right? So there is this nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics. There is this nonlinear term. Now, if you want to calculate the moments, then there should be a hierarchy of moments, right? How do you get around that? I never, never compute any moments. You see, the the, the point is that uh, uh, no, I mean, you know, what would be nice is to sort of make more sophisticated things. But but at the moment, uh, this is completely honest. I mean, that's simply sort of the state state of of you know current understanding. We either do the decoupling, which, which has nothing to do with moments. I mean, it's just saying that, you know, I have a nonlinear equation with couplings, and under certain conditions, I can ignore the, I just make out of a sort of three component equation, I make a one component equation. That, that's one argument, which is not based on, on, on any moments or whatsoever. It's just sort of a more heuristic argument that, you know, things are far apart, and therefore they should be independent. Okay, then the other thing, which, which sort of is, is very useful actually numerically, and, and, and which we sort of exploited a lot, is that, uh, uh, the, the, we do moments, but but only up to a certain moment, and then then uh, then you sort of do a, a, a six moment if you want, so in that counting, and then you make uh, it's sort of one loop mode approximation. You know, then then you sort of close the hierarchy at that particular order, and then you get a cubic nonlinear but deterministic. Okay, so you get basically an equation for 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 I mean very schematically, you get an equation DDT of your three by three matrix S, which is, okay, now I'm writing it extremely schematically, but you know, there's a time integral and all these things, but which is basically something which is cubic in S, okay? That, that's sort of when, when you do the closure, okay? Now, now this is a nonlinear equation for US, which, uh, which you know, some of the things you can say analytically, you can uh, actually, I mean, this is what we did first. I mean, we spent uh, months just solving this equation on the computer. And, and, and there you can see many of the things which I'm sort of you know, telling you with a certain level of confidence. I mean, they mostly come from, from, from solving this equation, right? In this equation, you can now say, okay, let, let, let's make, for instance, you know, here the couplings I can choose sort of by hand, right? I mean, I just put them in, so I can say, okay, let, let's do the coupling of the central mode equal to zero, and let's see what it does, right? And indeed, it does go to, to, to this Levy thing, and so, so, so th this is a very good laboratory to actually, you know, <laughs> see what comes out. So, so th these are the two techniques which we have at the moment. And um, to do more, I mean, yeah, welcome. I have a very simple question. If instead of looking at the xt uh, correlation function, you yes. look at its Fourier transform, yes. k omega, which by the way, experimentalists do all the time. Special, That's fine, yes. Then would you still get one central peak and oh, yeah, two sure. sound peaks? Oh yeah, every, every, just do and Fourier. And then the, the scaling will be on what? On the... Width? Well, on the omega, no, no. I mean, uh, so yeah, of course you, you can do... No, no, no. I mean, you can do the, the, the s of k and omega, right? I mean, 
so you can do the S of, okay, let's put in head, I mean, S of k and omega. I mean, you know, this is sort of k omega small, right? And, uh, well, I mean, you would, you, would, you, would, uh, you would see still the peaks for the sound peaks, you know, and the Fourier transform, this, I mean, you know, this moving peak, I mean, the moving will be just an oscillating factor, right? I mean, no, sorry. The moving will be also shift in, in, in omega. Yeah, that's right. And so you, you will, okay, you see, then, then, then in the broadening, I mean, you will see this function sort of more or less directly, right, because it's already Fourier transform. And, and, and uh, you, you will see, uh, you will see the, the Fourier transform, you know, so you will see, you know, this FKPC scaling function uh, and then it's Fourier transform. If you look in our papers, we have also written things in, in this language. It's, uh, it, it depends on, on, on uh, you know, which corner of physics you grow up. I mean, it's, it's perfectly fine okay, to so do so these things. And certainly, certainly when, we, when, when we do the mode coupling equation, it's, it's uh, well, you can write it in both variables. But, but the point is that the mode coupling equation is most naturally written in terms of t, actually, rather than in terms of omega. Well, I understand, but my question is really simple. Is it uh, three halves? And uh, five. Yeah, third. yeah, sure. The, 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 Will it be the width of the peak, the width uh, of the thing? No, 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 no. It's uh, also the broadening. It's high. That's no, no. It's a broadening. Well, I have. I, I show you the formula. I mean, then uh, I can answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what? Is, <coughs> what is the dependence on the initial condition? Because uh, I mean, at least we know that for KPZ there is some. Uh, memory of the initial condition, right? I mean, depending on the yes. geometry of the initial condition. So here, so, what is the... So, okay, uh, the, the, this, 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 um, um, okay, so the, the, I mean, the, there's sort of an answer. So, I mean, first of all, you know, what we studied, I mean, we, we never studied very systematically dependence on initial conditions, okay? So the only thing which I can say is that um, if you would measure some other correlation functions, it eventually will be always the same three peak structure. But of course, the weights under the peaks depend on the initial conditions. I mean, depend on the, on, on the observables of which I compute the correlation, right? I mean, so as long, as long as we compute something like this, I mean, so, so I take equilibrium averages, so this is my equilibrium average. And, and let's say I, I, have, I have some, so, so of course it's important that I look at some local function, right? And so I look at some local function G, of, of uh, well, let's say, I, let, let, let me my notation, and, and some, some other local function, zero, zero, right? I mean, so, and, and I, I, I mean, of course, they should be local, but, uh, you know, I mean, maybe living on a few sites or so, but, but otherwise, I, you know, I just don't want to say anything about the G, right? just any, any, any old G, okay? Then what I'm saying is that when you look at the long time behavior of this thing, you will see necessarily the three peak structure. So, you know, this as a function of space and time, We'll have again the three peaks. I mean, so we'll, see, we'll definitely look like this. But for instance, it could be that the coefficient of that particular peak is zero because uh, you know th th that depends on the function. So the area under each of these peaks depends on which particular function I picked. Okay. But um, uh, if you want to get more into you know like like uh, I don't know domain wall initial conditions things of this type. I mean this we simply haven't investigated very. I mean there's one paper actually which we have investigated domain wall boundary conditions. So, you know, sort of uh, one equilibrium here and then the step, and another equilibrium on the other side. So, I mean, there's one paper on domain wall boundary conditions. Uh, yeah, uh, almost forgot. I mean, so, so this is the only case where we sort of started with true non equilibrium. And then, of course, this, this picture gets somewhat modified. I mean, it's not, 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 I mean, you have to write a paper in order to understand what's going on, right? Okay, so uh, thank you again. Mm -hmm.